welcome to Cinderella Law, Criminalising Parental Authority. I'm the chair, my name is Jane Sanderman, and I convene the Institute of Ideas Parents Forum, uh, who, who along with Illegal Salem is hosting this event. This session is looking at the law, is it uh, overreaching itself into the area of parenting and uh, personal life, I suppose. I think every parent has had the experience, particularly when your children have gone in their primary school to their child line lesson, which does occur, that your child, when you try to say something they don't like, says, I'll report child line on you. And I think this summer as well, we saw the Aisha King <coughs> situation, when what happens to parental authority, when instead of institutions in society seeming to bolster parental authority, actually what they seem to be, and that was a, an unholy amalgamation of the law, the NHS, um, social workers, when they uh, undermine parental authority and what does that mean for us, our children and society in general. We have three very interesting speakers to tackle this very important subject um, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. So first and foremost is Stuart Wayton, who is a lecturer in sociology and criminology at Abertay University and author of, among other things, Snobs Law. I mean, he, he writes books uh, really looking at the personal and uh, the social space and what that does mean uh, for what people are becoming. Uh, in the middle, I have um, Dee Thomas, who is the mother of four children. And I know that I should have said Stuart's the, the father of two children, but it's particular in the sense of um, Dee being an active campaigner in seeing things that are happening in Scotland that are very much uh, infringing onto parental um, authority. I mean, it, it, it's, it's very direct there. At the moment, there's the note of the named person campaign in Scotland, which Dee is very active in. Um, and so, uh, She's doing perhaps what uh, some of us would really admire is that actually going out and speaking and raising your head above the parrot pet when some of these initiatives are done to your children rather than thinking, oh my God, but I'm going to keep my head low. So um, thank you for Dee for coming. And last but not least, um, and who's our legal person on the panel, given it is a legal strand, is Daniel Monk, who's a reader in law at Birkbeck University of London, assistant editor of Child and Family Law Quarterly, and has looked at child rights and the family and what that means in, in, in relationship to that setup. So, uh, without any more ado, Stuart, if you can start. Okay, thank you. Uh, I haven't timed this, so I'll, I'll start speaking slowly, and as I go on, I might start speaking quicker and quicker as my time uh, runs out. I, I'm really here because I've also been involved. I helped, helped to set up the campaign against the named person legislation. Uh, in Scotland, which I'm not going to say anything about, because I think Dee will probably say something about that. So I'll just, if I mention it, don't worry if you don't know what it actually is, because uh, hopefully Dee will say something. Um, and I thought what I would do today, I'm not going to look at the Cinderella law and the idea of whether emotional abuse should be illegal. I thought I would just look at the question of the family um, and whether, the, whether we actually support the family today uh, in, in a classical sense. Okay, so... Uh, the family, I would argue, historically, especially say in the 19th century, but for much of the 20th century, was seen as an active thing. It made people. It made individuals, in a modern sense of what that means. These individuals had certain ideal attributes. Uh, these attributes were largely liberal, you could say, but also uh, con had conservative aspects to them. So it was about... How do you create people who are responsible, who are moral, who are self-reliant, uh, and who were part of this thing called the autonomous family, okay, which was about privacy. And that was a central aspect of what the family was and why the family was seen as good. Uh, now, you can debate the extent to which, which might be worth looking at, debate the extent to which this family actually existed, because there's various discussions about whether the family was colonised by professionals throughout various uh, periods, uh, with the expansion of the state uh, and so on. Uh, and I think we can look at the extent to which uh, the buffers that existed to protect the family uh, have declined, which I think is probably the best thing to debate for my interest in this issue. So what's changed? I would argue that particularly from the 1990s, the classical liberal sense of the autonomous family uh, has come under attack 
uh, and the idea of uh, individual rights and privacy uh, have declined. I think we've also seen a decline in traditional morality, especially that's associated with Christianity. We've also seen a decline in classical socialist arguments. Socialist arguments were important because socialist arguments would say, when some people would say the problem is the, with the family, we need to do something about the family, socialists would say the problem is not with the family, the problem is with society, the problem is unemployment, the problem is poverty, leave the family alone. And these various strands, political strands, strands in society, I would say acted as buffers and pre prevented the family from being fully colonised by professionals. So previously the family was seen by its very nature, I'd argue, as a good thing that de developed moral and independent individuals. And I think a good example of this is when you look at the emergence of foster care uh, that developed uh, around the time of the start of the 20th century. And when you got foster care developing, uh, and things like adoption. Essentially, the model that was seen as being positive was how can you find something that is as close to the family as possible. So in other words, and this isn't for all professionals, many professionals would say, well, the thing that a child needs is a family. Right? How do we construct, how do we create, or how do we just replicate the family? Okay, so that's what the professionals uh, were trying to do. Today, I would say that the opposite is happen happens today. We rarely talk about families uh, and family in the way that we used to. We now talk about parents and particularly parenting. And what that means is that parents now are expected to be more like professionals. So rather than the other way around, where professionals would say that the ideal is the family, Today, the ideal is for the family or for parents to become like professionals. So you get discussions about parenting in terms of its skills, in terms of creating the correct environment, producing the correct outcomes, and you get this kind of alien language being adopted in all, almost all policy uh, in relation uh, to the family. So a few examples of this. Uh, every child matters, sorry, every parent matters in 2007 uh, came out, said, uh, there is a vital role for parents in improving their child's life chance. Traditionally, parenting has been a no-go area for governments, but now more than ever, government needs to be supportive of parents who are themselves increasingly seeking help. Uh, in the this, this Centre for Social Justice, Every Family Matters, uh, they have argued that we need to help people to get married. You need to ac actually teach people the skills needed to be married. David Cameron uh, similarly has come out and said parenting classes should be taken as seriously as driving lessons. So rather than the family as an institution in itself in terms of its privacy and, and its autonomy being seen as particularly and significantly important, the opposite has happened and now we think parents need to be trained uh, like professionals. Uh, in Scotland, Deal hopefully come up to the name person uh, issue, this has happened most uh, profoundly with the emergence of the named person uh, legislation. And essentially, I think the reason that we're getting this discussion about emotional abuse is due to this collapse of any sense of the importance of the autonomous family in society. We're here to talk about criminalising parents for emotional neglect, but I'd like to focus on the mechanisms that the state will use to do this. Nearly two years ago, my 10-year-old son came out of, out of school saying something creepy and weird had happened in class. Had he been anywhere other than school, I would have called the police. Instead, I rang the council and have ended up campaigning to expose something that's embedding itself into social policy both at Westminster and Holyrood. It's called Prevention Science and it comes from the United States and governments love it. Prevention science gives governments media sound bites that can be sold to the public as robust evidence of risk to child well-being. My son's creepy and weird experience was called Evidence to Success, an online well-being survey from the states that scores the risk and protective factors offered to children by their parents. It was created to score the urban poor in America and it's now been exported for trial in the UK. 
For example, it scores parenting as protective if a child plays regularly with children who attend religious services. But it scores parenting as risky if a child's view is not taken into consideration when making family decisions. Parents are automatically scored as a risk if they're unemployed or a step-parent. Parenting styles to me are as individuals as fingerprints. And if governments homogenise parenting down to a narrow prescription, future generations will become intolerant of difference. Children benefit from seeing their friends' parents do things differently. It informs their future parenting skills. We all parent differently, and there are also cultural differences to parenting in the UK versus the United States. One way is not better, and a scoring mechanism used on the urban poor in America cannot scientifically validate how we choose to bring up our children in the UK. The Scottish Government has now scored over 40,000 state school children against US-designed risk and protective factors, and they intend to continue. The big lottery are also funding evidence to success to score parents in areas of multiple, multiple deprivation in England. They propose to carry out epigenetic testing, taking DNA samples from the cheek swabs of two-month-old babies to show genetic damage inflicted in pregnancy. So when it comes to the so-called Cinderella law, it'll only be a matter of time before a bespoke tool is designed to generate the evidence needed by governments to criminalise parents. Holyrood has just legislated to assign state-paid named persons to oversee the well-being of every Scottish child. The Information Commissioner, Ken MacDonald, tells me the well-being surveys underpin that legislation. Surprisingly, he doesn't have a problem with the survey questions. My 10-year-old son was asked, do people in your family often shout in each other's faces? Do you carry a knife? Have you used cannabis over the last 30 days? And if he'd been 14, he would have been asked if he'd had anal sex. But what made me really angry was that my boy was asked if he thought he was no good at all, if he thought he was a failure, and if he thought his life just wasn't worth it. My son was asked a suicide question with the blessing of the information commissioner. Creepy and weird, I call it stealing his innocence without my permission. Parents cannot choose their child's name person or even object. Written government guidelines now define objectors as hostile parents who are resistant to changing their behaviours. The named person can share and receive information about my family with the police, NHS and social work via an IT system known as the Secure Portal of Concern. The Secure Portal of Concern, it sounds like something out of Doctor Who. But child wellbeing is a two-tier system. Is a parent who pays £30,000 to a boarding school guilty of isolating and rejecting and emotionally neglecting their child? Will these farmed out children be scored online for isolation and rejection? Will they be asked if their life is worthless? I doubt it. Because prevention science doesn't address inequalities in society. It sells governments mechanisms for controlling dissent. Parents must reclaim their authority from the state, which is why I'm part of the No to Name Person campaign. I think prevention science is as robust as a chocolate microscope, but after all, what do I know? Um, I want to identify some of the ways in which this Cinderella law fits in with broader trends. I also then want to identify what I consider to be a curious paradox and then end with a question which I'm struggling with and which in some ways might be an opportunity for me to say, uh, to get some battle going on here and perhaps actually defend the law in a way, not that I do. So where does it fit with uh, broader trends? There is this growing tendency to criminalise intimate space. Family law and criminal law are coming together in a number of different areas, far more closely than ever used to be. Mothers, and it is mothers, who fail to get their children to school, their truanting children who don't want to get to school, are being criminalised more than ever before. Parents, and it's again, it's mothers who generally refuse to allow the other parent, the father, if they've separated from seeing their child, challenges contact arrangements, can also be criminalised. 
increasing attempts to broaden the criminal definition of domestic violence. Consensual sex, where one person then is, contracts HIV, that's also seen a new form of criminalizing of intimate spheres. So it fits into this broader trend. It also fits in very closely with the coming together of law and psychology. And there's a very powerful, discursive coalition when law and psychology come together. Um, the, there seems to be this idea that everybody's failures in life, everything that happens in someone's life, can be explained through an individualized therapeutic culture, often going right back to the early years. This is what everything calls. All the ills can be identified in that way. That's the psychology part. And on the law part, there's the idea that all of the ills can be resolved through law. So when they come together, law and psychology, you get a very crude social policy. Because law and psychology are very different at the same time as telling stories about the same things. What happens, I think, is that it's easier to criminalize than it is to address broader social investment issues around uh, children. Um, if this was really a government that wanted to support and look after children, providing proper childcare facilities would have a much greater benefit than actually um, trying to criminalise individual parents. But that would cost a lot of money. So the individualised account that psychology and law provides, as opposed to broader social policy debates, are the route through which debates take place. I also think it's important to recognise how symbolic criminal law is. Durkheim, the sociologist, said that criminal law was never a rational social defence against harm, merely a passionate reaction, a matter of feelings that created social solidarity. And in this context, the solidarity there is for a particular, perhaps a form of stressed, exhausted, middle-class parenting that sacrifices everything the whole way, and it needs to bolster up its own idea of sacrifice by complaining and identifying demon parents who don't seem to be sacrificing enough. I just throw that out there as a provocation. The paradox is that in child contact cases, the courts are saying that the child must have contact with an absent parent, often the separated father, even though that child is going to be exposed to potentially emotional abuse and domestic violence. There's a lot of campaigns saying, why is the law forcing children to have contact with parents where there's domestic violence? And here, at the other hand, it's saying that the, crim the criminal law should criminalise domestic uh, uh, emotional abuse. And there's a paradox there. Very quickly with my problem, though, I've, all this seems to paint towards saying why I think it's very problematic, this law, and I do. But if we think that if a parent breaks a child's leg, that should, the law legitimately should intervene, and if we think, which I think most people would agree, that, of course, psychological harm can indeed be far more uh, deep-seated and more damaging than the breaking of a bone. I mean, it's awful if, you, if, you know, if a parent breaks your, a child's arm. That's an awful thing, but it can mend. And if psychological harm is serious, why should we treat it differently? That's my problem, my question at the end. Thank you. Right, well, um, thank you very much to the panel. <laughs> really interesting speeches. Um, just one question, then I'll throw it out to the audience because we've got such a short session. Um, when talking to people about this session, people seem to me to say, well, you're either for the state and against harm to the child. I, I don't know whether that's mm. um, part of what you're saying, Daniel, or f you're for the family. And, and, it, and people definitely seem to see, the f you know, your family, I guess you're anti-state, presumably conservative, versus for the child, uh, for mm. children's rights, you know, for someone protecting the children. So I just wondered if mm. the panel had come across that and what they think about that. Mm. Stuart? Um, yeah, you, the way you ask the question is to suggest that that's wrong. Mm. You're right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in some ways I think it's right as it happens. Because, um, and I would put it in a different way that I think, in general, people who, generally speaking, trust other people will think this law is problematic. People who, generally speaking, don't trust other people will be more supportive uh, of this law. 
Um, and increasingly, I think that's how the world seems to pan out, that whatever the issue is, I think you can try and work out whether the person you're talking to is a good person or a bad person by whether they uh, actually trust people or not, rather than with uh, kind of old political categories of, you know, are you against racism for this, for that? Um, so that, that's the way I would think about it. I think possibly people find it hard to come down in one camp or another because there's maybe not enough debate about the issues. If I take an example which is not particularly to do with, with children in Scotland, we now have police officers walking around in Scotland routinely with guns in shopping centres. It wasn't debated at all, it was a unilateral decision that was taken. And I think in terms of the work that I'm doing with the No to Na Name Person campaign, you can see elements of, of that things just have not been thought through or debated enough, so people are unclear as to which side they should support or where they should be positioned on it. Um, yeah, I think that binary is problematic in a way because I think it sets up the idea on one hand you've got the nanny state rolling in, telling people what to do as the problem and then, the, and my problem with that is that I think the state is very important. The state impacts on this, what we want to call a private sphere, but actually is totally affected by state laws in lots of areas constantly. So planning laws in local areas, education laws, health provision, all of these things have an enormous impact on on families and on, uh, and on communities. So challenging this as a way of wanting to challenge the state, to me, doesn't really get to the hub of it. Thank you, very useful. Um, now over to you. A uh, question for Stuart. I was just wondering um, your view that the autonomy of the family is being undermined and just thinking about perhaps the broader causal factors for that. And is it perhaps not the case that as nuclear families tended, um, I mean, I don't want to sort of romanticise the extended family, but people tended to have kind of broader community structures and families were more inserted in that. And those communities played a kind of policing role within themselves in terms of parental behaviour, you know, um, people being encouraged to, uh, you know, be involved in other people's families. And because of the concern with public space and the maybe just more atomised um, nature of neoliberal society, the state has taken up that role and, and really thrown itself very enthusiastically into that role, but perhaps for broader reasons about other things that can't be controlled by the government these days. Um, and given that that is perhaps the case, what can we then do about that? Because it seems like it's almost an inevitable dynamic that as families become more atomised, you are going to get the state becoming more and more heavy-handed into those families and then making very subjective decisions about who's a good parent and who isn't. I think that's a really good point, and I think it is kind of more or less exactly what's happening or the way it looks to me. I mean, the more you have um, policing of parents in a more or less overt form, and this um, existence of um, really kind of broken down relationships within families <coughs> focusing on the parent, overseen by various forms of state agencies. I think what it does is to just encourage more and more the complete collapse and more or less disappearance of anything that we would call a public space or a community or a kind of wider context around families um, and it seems to me it creates this um, process whereby it's not that it, it's not that, the, that, that, that there's any more privacy you get the kind of real kind of erosion and collapse of privacy at the same time as a collapse of the public the two are happening at the same time and what you end up really is state intervention and in individuals you know that's that's you know, more or less as far as I can see what, what you've now got. And I think that this, that the Cinderella law is interesting as part of, of that process and a, and a very important one because, you see, take, say you take the way that you talk about it, Daniel. If you think about, in truth, what, the circumstances in which and the, the, the practical realities of a parent breaking the limb of a child, mm. I mean, that involves a phenomenal use of force and would not exist separate to a more general terribleness 
within a family. In, in other words, I think this idea that you've got physical abuse and stuff that goes on at an emotional level somehow existing separately. What's being suggested now is that you do, that somehow you have, I mean, it's a completely invented phenomenon, the idea of these, you know, relentlessly ab emotionally abusive parents, where there's just this kind of psychological abuse that exists in total separation from anything else. I mean, it's not how any actual real problems of the, of, of the small number that exist do exist, but I think what it does is that once you construct that vision of this kind of relentless emotional abuse, what it actually does is make people perceive the much more real experience of bringing up kids. I mean, I think if you ask any parent in, in, in this room, and I will openly admit it, you know, on any given day, I <coughs> move from being the most lovely mum in the world to one that is really cross with my kids, emotionally abusing them. You know, that's the reality of bringing up children. But what it does when you create this separate phenomenon of emotional abuse is make people focus on what's just part of the general picture of bringing up kids. Take it out of any kind of context and then criminalise it. And it is so destructive of privacy. Because if you intervene on that basis, you destroy everything. You destroy the love as well. Because both go together. You know, that's the truth of bringing up kids. Okay. Is it's love and hate all the time mixed up. <laughs> that's the reality of it, isn't it? Um, I just want to support Dee in what she's saying, is that, in that the situation is really very serious. And believe me, it's just as serious in England, here in London, as it is in Scotland. Um, I know a family where about 10 or 11 months ago, it's a Moroccan family, by the way, and the mother decided that because her husband wasn't giving, bringing in money at the moment, because he's unemployed, actually, he's looking for another job. He's a nurse and he's looking for another job. Um, he was not doing, you know, the economic side of supporting the family. So she went off to get advice at the Moroccan Advice Centre. And they said, oh, uh, you know, and I think they talked about she needed more independence. And they said, well, you'll have to accuse them of this, 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 and this. Um, you know, sign up to this and we'll help you. So she signed up to it, went home, thought, oh my God, cancelled it, rang them up to cancel it. The police arrived, the social workers arrived. Now, the social workers have been at this all these months, okay? Now, the father is accused of emotional abuse. This is linked to his, in quotes, controlling behavior. There's no evidence for this, by the way. I've read, read all the reports. They just say he presents controlling behavior. And he is also accused of domestic violence. There is no evidence for any of this. This has been going on and on and on. The children are regularly, they've got three lovely boys, beautifully brought up by their loving father, very, very loving father, also a lovely husband. Um, they're taken out of the family, they are interviewed by the social workers again and again and again and again. The social workers write up that the boys keep saying, oh, he's a wonderful father. Ah, so this shows that the boys have been affected by their father's controlling behaviour, they write, <laughs> and, <laughs> and that they are defensive of their father. And they take this as evidence that his, this controlling behaviour is being passed from one generation to the next. The family remain under these accusations all these months later, I don't know how to help them. I don't know whether your campaign can help them. But believe me, this is a very, very real issue. There is this chicken and egg uh, relationship to the state. So, because obviously, one, in one way, Stuart, you painted, well, there was this nuclear family and, you know, it, it brought people up morally and, uh, you know, created the norms of society. But as the lady in the audience said, but that perhaps is not the model of the modern family when there's a lack of community, there's a disruption. Um, you know, it, 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 a more problematic side, and therefore the state is stepping in. Um, but then the other lady saying, well, but, but then that creates a vicious circle. The state then seems to step in, which breaks the community. So I guess that's one of the items. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with my students, I always talk to my students about we live in this atomized world, because right? I know they don't really know what I'm talking about, so I, I keep saying it. But on the, uh, so yes, the extended family right, doesn't really exist, so people are more isolated. But people are also not that isolated. People have plenty of friends, and you know, we don't all just live <laughs> in a tiny little bubble without any contact, any conversation with anybody. Um, but the problem is, it's so the problem's not particularly isolation as such. It's I mean, I think for people making this point, I think. The problem is that parenting has been problematized and professionalized so much 
that it's confusing and it's difficult to trust yourself and trust your friend's judgment. So I did this, I interviewed these parents a few years ago, uh, all went to a dance class with their kids. They're all about, uh, in their mid, late thirties, had kids who were seven, eight, nine, ten. And I was kind of asking them about how do they parent, do they find pressure, this, that, and all the rest of it. <clears throat> and one of the things that was interesting was that a number of them mentioned the naughty step that they used. And this was because there was some super nanny pain in the backside on the telly at the time, telling people that you can use the naughty step. And what I found so fascinating about that was that a lot of these people adopted this thing that was on the telly, like that, which suggests that people are anxious and unsure, I think, about are they doing the right thing? And then they kind of, rather than, you know, you're quite sure in yourself. But I think that's because, you know, at, at every level, I mean, the name person stuff I'll come back to, I'll shut up now, but in terms of the level of professional intervention and expectation of involvement with parents and parenting now, I think is, t is quite worrying uh, and must be very difficult for young parents to trust themselves and their own judgment. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to um, quote um, Larkin, it seems really important, you know, your parents, they fuck you up. They don't mean to, but they do. And that seems to go back to the point you were making there in a way about what real life is about and how do you define emotional abuse. I mean, we, it's... Um, that's the, that, that is the normal thing. So it being emotionally, having, uh, being emotionally <laughs> scarred by what your parents do to you is what, is what gives you your personality, what gives you your character, what gives you your distinctiveness. I can't make a distinction between the emotional scars I suffered from my parents from who I am as a person. It is what makes people human. <coughs> parents fuck up their kids. That's, they always have done, they always will. The problem with that is how do you draw, uh, um, do you just stand back always and say that's fine? Do you become totally relative about it? And I'm just not sure about that. The criminal law has since 1997 made clear, so in a sense this isn't new this law, going back to my idea that actually it's about um, a symbolic thing. It's not new in a way. The law actually is already there. In 1997, the, the judges, anyone who was here at the last panel realised actually the judges got there before Parliament did. The judges said that grievous bodily harm could be psychological. You can inflict grievous bodily harm on somebody without touching them. You can inflict grievous bodily harm on somebody by sending them letters in the post, by picking up the phone calling them and then just dropping the phone down. That's grievous bodily harm. And the law institutionalised that in 1997. So it's not new, this. What's new is, as I think, this obsession with parenting. And I think it's not so much about the obsession with parenting, but perhaps another way of looking at it is the idea of having the perfect child somehow. The notion that the child has got to be brilliant, successful. The child, all these obsessive middle-class parenting. It's a concern that the child might not live up to expectations. So perhaps people just need to drop the expectations for children, and then we'll be a bit more relaxed about parenting. I don't normally swear in public. <laughs> I mean, I think from my experience as a parent, that I've absolutely fucked some of my children up. But I think that that is... Um, <laughs> arrest me. Um, I think that, that I've done it because to prepare them for a world that's going to fuck them up and they need to be prepared for, for what they're going to go out into. Now, I wanted to answer the lady over here or, or just back up what you've said. I've had to bring up all my children and, and there are actually five of them because I'm also a wicked step parent. Yeah. But um, I've had to bring them all up really differently on an emotional level. I mean, there's some that I've had to like really bolster their confidence and tell them they're great when, frankly, they're not really. But I've had to bolster them up. And then there's others that I've had to like really pull into line because they're so big for their boots that, that I've had to belittle them. And, you know, I, I don't know how a state can... That's a, for me, that, that was a very sort of like motherly instinct thing of, you know, like, I don't know, a lioness nipping one more than she nips another one to keep mm. them in line. Um, I probably didn't even really think about it too deeply. I just did it along the way. But I think, I th I think in terms of, of what you're saying, parents do that for the very best of reasons because they know the world that the child's going out into. Mm. 
just do one through a little bit and then I'll go oh, back yeah. back because it's not the hands. I, I don't think I've fucked my kid up at all, actually. <laughs> I think I'm really great. That's because I don't they just do their own thing. I don't have anything to do with them. It just seems perfect to me. <laughs> it's neglect. <laughs> this neglect. <laughs> 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 but just just on this point, because I, I kind of at one level I like this idea that, you know, are we expect the perfect child? But then I thought, well actually perhaps it's the opposite to that and that we expect we think children are so fragile. It's, it's the opposite, it's not the kind of pushy parent, it's the, we're not overprotective. And I thought about it, because I did a debate this week with the students on competitive sports, um, where I was essentially arguing that win at all cost is a good thing, and other, someone else was arguing <coughs> against competition. And a friend of mine works in this area, and he's horrified by all the new sort of rules and regulations <laughs> coming in to try and teach parents how not to push their kids. Right? This is even in where you've got competitive sports. So one of the things, for example, that parents are now going to be trained in Scotland via Sports Scotland is that when their kid comes home having played sport, what, they mustn't ask them, did you win? <laughs> and there's a, list, there's a list of 20 things that you should not ask your child because that's putting pressure on them and you must not empty their emotional tank. And this is what parents will be taught by coaches uh, who are concerned about parents pushing their kids too hard. I mean, that's the extent to which we're problematizing the relationships between parents and children. Okay. So just going back to the point about who gets demonized as a parent, because what I've noticed is that um, increasingly, even if parents think they're doing the best thing for their children, so you get perhaps a middle class parent who um, home educates. Uh, they can still be, I mean, home educators actually are um, frequently now being hauled in for questioning with social services. So you're completely wrong footed. It doesn't matter what you think you're doing um, in terms of raising the perfect child, the best educated, the most um, emotionally <coughs> well-rounded and balanced child, um, you are still you know, possibly going to get a visit from social services. At some point, there will be an interpretation of that behaviour as um, controlling or isolating the child from their peers or something. So you can't win. Um, and just a, a quick second point. I think it was Daniel who was asking about um, why emotional abuse is problematic. And I, I think it's problematic to separate it out of the category because if it's not seen in the context of other neglect, um, physical abuse, neglect, as in poverty, you know, there's poverty, then politically we can't <coughs> do anything really for those children. So if the bigger picture's not there, it is, as you say, it's all about the individualised approach. I'm really puzzled as to why we are now in the 21st century proposing to criminalise parenting. It, it seems to me that children nowadays are better nourished, better behaved, better educated and have far more opportunities than children of earlier generations. So, you know, you, you have to ask why. And I'm sure there's many reasons, but I, I do think that one of the reasons is because we have a real difficulty now in coping with individual problems. Wherever there is seen to be a particular problem, a particular child, harm then there has to be a social solution. Um, th the reason for that is because we have difficulty nowadays balancing that particular individual harm against any wider principle which is in play. So if you only focus on the particular family and on the particular child who may have been harmed, then obviously, if that's the sole focus of your inquiry, then you'll come forward with a solution. But what do you lose in doing that? What it seems to me you lose is the much more general and important principle of allowing parents to learn from their own mistakes, giving them the freedom to experiment for themselves with different ways of parenting. And it is that inability to focus now on the bigger principle and assuming that individual particular harms can always trump it, which is so problematic, not just incidentally in the question of parenting, but in so many other areas of social policy. The technical question, I suppose, which also can reveal something that's happening in terms of the named person legislation in Scotland, um, there seems to be a change from the, the, on the basis that social services get involved in family life. What, it used to be at risk, and that seemed to be a technical term, and now it's a cause for concern. 
And this, for me, seems to be quite an insidious way. I mean, what I want to know is if, if that is a technical difference and, and what that really represents. But for me, it's an insidious expansion in terms of bringing people's um, prejudice and, and, and hearsay in, in to, to, to childcare uh, practices. And, and, and in a sense, it's also setting up the people who are going to become the named people, the named persons. As an example, my, my, my four-year-old daughter cycles to nursery school each day. And, um, each time the, 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 the good ladies, who are, who are really good nursery nurses, say, oh, she should really be wearing a helmet. And, you know, I don't want my daughter to wear a helmet for a number of reasons. I don't think it actually makes her any safer, et cetera, et cetera, which I can explain to anyone later. But that now is going to become a cause for concern. Okay, I am now putting my daughter at risk. And I said that to them, I said, is this a cause for concern? You could see the light bulb switch on with their head. Um, in, their, in their eyes when I said, is this a cause for concern? Because they now understand the relationship between me and them is going to have to change because of their professional role. And, um, it, is, it, is it different? How, how different is a cause for, for concern from being at risk, which seem to be legally defined and laid <coughs> down? You know, this is it's just an expansion of prejudice to me. Just to ask the panel how they felt about social work, because Daniel's making the point we've got the family on one side and the state on the other, and surely there's some, something in between that. And there is something in between that. It's called social services. They existed for a long period of time, and they operated quite effectively. And I, they were trusted in the past to make judgments about when a child was genuinely at risk. That trust of social work is gone now, and everybody else that has any contact with the child is seen as being par partially responsible for making this judgment too, which is what the name person is about. So I have a friend who's a social worker that complains to me that teachers are over-enthusiastic about their desire to take children into accommodation and they will ring up social services and say that their child has been, a particular child in the school, they deem to be at risk and therefore um, they want social services to come in and accommodate them. So I think Probably the, the real crisis, strangely, is that even though we criticise social workers, is that we don't trust social workers to make that judgement about a minority of people that really are putting their children at risk. And I'm one of those evil people who are in the parenting profession, and um, I've been training up people to run parenting courses for over the last 30 years. And um, I can see, I can see um, what Dee was saying, that you know this questionnaire does sound incredibly crass and, um, you know, counterproductive and trying to take something that's from an urban American environment to a Scottish environment, it sounds completely mad. But I'm worried that you're, that you're throwing away the baby with the bathwater because there are lots of vulnerable children out there who do need protection. And I think by kind of withdrawing the state altogether, you can leave these children without any sources of support at all. And also just from my experiences of people, you know, training up parents in their local community to run parenting courses, often the parents say how much they've really enjoyed the courses and learning some kind of like, some skills which are out there that kind of bring them up to the top, does make an enormous change in their relationships with their children. And I've seen trajectories completely change where parents really start to enjoy their children and vice versa, whereas before they didn't. And so I think there's a danger of saying, oh, these bad, bad social workers or bad named people or bad whatever. But, you know, the children are the most vulnerable people in society and some do need protection. And that's the, and that is the, um, that, that's what the states has to do. I'm going to stop Daniel, actually. I'm okay, yeah. Just uh, picking up from the last point, which go back to the others, I think there's a, um, one of the dangers of this stretching of the definition is it belittles the importance of focusing on major mm. harms. And I think there's that broader tendency to expand definitions of harm. And I think one of the problems is not that it's just anti-social work, but it just means we will belittle the importance of focusing on where social work really should be focusing on. I also want to ask a question about, um, parents make decisions all the time in relation to their children. And the way in which they make those decisions, that knowledge comes from somewhere. Why is it so different from that knowledge to come from a parenting advisor than it is from it to come from anywhere else? As a provocation. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would, in, I would, of course, instantly say because with the 
huge, huge respect that the parenting advisor doesn't know every single in and out of my child and how they feel and how they react to certain situations. They're not with them all the time. So mm. that's how I'd, I would answer that. Mm. But I think the bathwater question, it comes down to resources. Social workers have, have probably the hardest and the most valuable job to do. But if you spend all this money monitoring everybody, you're going to have less money to spend caring for the people who are the most vulnerable. Uh, the named person thing is that every child in Scotland now in law will have a state named individual to oversee their interests from birth to 18. Uh, and the trigger, which is what Simon at the front was talking about now, is if you have a concern for it to investigate, so this is teachers will be the main ones, it'll be health workers to start with, then it'll be nursery workers, then it'll be teachers, so the name person changes. Um, and the, they have shifted it from serious risk of harm, as a reason for, to start an investigation, to concern about well-being. Well-being is now defined by the Shinari indicators, there it is, uh, which are, if you are concerned about their safety, health, achieving, nurtured, active, respected, responsible, included, and there's a whole list of things that then sh offshoot there. So if you're concerned about any of those things in terms of a child's well-being, you can trigger an investigation into a parent. Uh, and the concern about one of the problems that, or concerns people have, or we have, is that obviously the more children are drawn, which I would suggest this will draw more children into the, uh, the, the, the rubric of social work concern. So the very, very small number of children who should be being supported uh, will, could potentially uh, be lost in the system. Just quickly on the social work question, there's a, there's a social worker who works on this campaign called Mally, Maggie Mellon, who's an old socialist type social worker. And to me, her approach is a good one. She says, well, you should support families. You should recognize families have difficulties and you should try and help them. That often means you get the need home help, they need a bit of extra financial support, they need something for the back, they need this. They need things. And you don't separate the children's needs from the family's needs. So it's now basically social work has become about child protection. So you walk into a family and you look at it in the, through the prism of child protection where the parents are often seen as being problematic. She, she argues that it's very difficult to get a home help into a family for a week. It's extremely easy to take that child out of that uh, home. And that's the shift. And uh, the number of kids being taken away from their families has increased by 50% in the last 10 years in Scotland. I think um, when you were opening, you mentioned Childline and um, going to schools. And I think, um, for me, that is also another very uh, pernicious thing that's happened today um, to the family, where really any idea that you could possibly trust parents and trust families to sort out problems, to identify problems or to um, look after their children, to love their children, that that would be the overriding thing that the fam families, parents love their children, seems to have disappeared. And instead you get, you get these campaigns where um, at the NSPCC go into schools, every school, they've got a camp campaign going into every school, talking to young children, as young as eight or nine, with the whole idea that uh, these young children have to report not only their own parents but other people's parents um, to Childline and it's a very very uh, pernicious and undermining thing and in that um, context um, you can see how uh, the, basically the, the authorities come in um, and undermine totally the authority of parents. Thank you very much, nice and precise but to the gentleman behind you, him. <laughs> Daniel, surely psychological harm is, is different and should be treated very differently. And you've already alluded to the, the problem of the expansion of categories of harm. Um, I mean, I personally, I would reverse that whole Philip Larkin, Philip Larkin uh, 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 poem uh, and say it's the state that, to your, <laughs> you know, to your children rather than, uh, rather than you. Um, uh, I think this is probably clearest in, in the fact that it's, it's obviously a colonisation of the kind of it's a colonisation of the intimate space, but it's also a colonisation of, 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 uh, of your mind. What's a, are your thoughts appropriate? Not even, you know, I don't think even in, in 1984, George, you know, George Orwell could have imagined something as, uh, as, as, as intrusive 
as this uh, uh, going on. And I think it's already been mentioned, uh, you know, the kind of compulsory consent education uh, uh, for, uh, for adults at university. Uh, the children, they've already had it at, at school. I know but that our son's going to look forward to this, um, you know, where, they're, where they're kind of their, the appropriateness of their emotional response is going to be uh, uh, checked against some, some, some checklist and, and, and possibly uh, have some consequences, maybe a, a cause of concern afterwards. Just a question on the name person. Uh, can you opt out? I mean, it's quite an invidious position yeah. to place an employee of the state in. If the teacher at nursing school now knows that the named person for everyone in their class, or the teacher from the age of the kids age six onwards now knows, not if I've got to teach, but I've got to make sure that uh, I let the state step in if I feel this child is at risk in some way and um, bring the state in against the uh, parents. That's quite an invidious position. If you left in your awful position in a few years' time where named persons get sued for not doing their job correctly. Uh, for neglect and negligence, and that's the really system we want to see to send up a whole can of worms in terms of creating a process which is quite unworkable in practice, both for the families and the all terrible, well, the, the soy individuals who end up being named personally. So on this issue of the baby in the bathwater and the <coughs> proliferation of social services, um, of course it's a resources issue, but it also affects our perception and judgment. And this was brought home to me in the case of Daniel Pelka, who was a child who was at a nursery school, mainstream nursery school, and effectively starved to death in front of his teachers. And what that case really illustrated, I think, was that when these teachers saw a child, a five-year-old child, picking for scraps out of a bin and eating sand from a sand pit, they thought, well, social services have got involved. This is someone else's problem. And that, for me, is the real danger of the swamping effect of, or, or the, the, the expansion of social services into more and more of these cases, is that looking after those really difficult, problematic cases becomes someone else's problem. And now, to our panel coming from Daniel. Oh, goodness. Um, somebody, uh, one of the points made was that children are much better off now than ever before, so why is this happening now? I think it's important to take a long view of this, perhaps not to see this as remarkable, and perhaps go back to look at the early, late Victorian period and moral campaigns around working class families. I think a broader history is important, and to recognise that actually, if we accepted the privacy arguments about the family then, a lot of the reasons why children are so better off probably wouldn't be so true now. D. I'd just like to answer this gentleman, no, you can't object. There's no opt-out at all. You can't choose them. Lots of people probably won't even know who their name person is. You'll assume it's your head teacher. Right. If you're, sorry? The name person. Yeah. Uh, who knows? <laughs> and um, so that, that's, the, that's the answer to that. And if you do object, if you do stick your head above the parapet, then you probably will be defined, you will be characterised as a hostile parent and, and the spotlight will be on you and your, parent, your children then. I just think, from my point of view, this application of universal child protection, which has always been for significant concern in the past, and it's now for less than significant concern, but the application of universal child protection tramples on the rights of, of privacy, uh, of parents and children to have privacy and a right to a family life. And it does waste precious, precious resources that will be to the detriment of children who really do need, need care from the state. Yeah, I, I mean, as far as I know, I think it's illegal to be cruel to your child, as far as I understand it. And the thing, the thing I like about that, and compared with the emotional abuse thing, is I think what that... Being cruel to a child is, or being found guilty of, being, uh, of cruelty is because you there's a recognition that you have purposefully done something to your child. Whereas I think the emotional abuse category mm -hmm. will be something that will be defined by professionals mm -hmm. and where they assess what it is you did and what it is the child felt and therefore this is an emotional abuse. Even if you as a parent have got not a clue that you have done anything cruel to your child. Right? So that seems to be a problem to me. I, I just thought I'd finish just with a... I went through the, child, the, um, the Children and Young Person Bill, which is where the named person thing came out of. It's an 84-page document. And the term family, right, this is Children and Young Person Bill, where they consulted everybody, supposedly. The, ch the word family appears once in this document. The word families appears no time at all, 
whereas the word corporate parent or corporate parenting uh, uh, is the, in there 54 times. And when the children and young person minister was asked about the bill, she said, oh yes, uh, the named person, of course families also have a role. Right? Of course families also have a role. Right? This wasn't an ironic joke statement. This was, I think, a genuine reflection of how politicians uh, and these uh, professionals perceive how the world should, should be. Um, uh, thank you, panel, for a very stimulating...